नमस्ते मनीषा वेलकम एंड जिंदाबाद बिल्कुल तो मनीषा व्हाट इज योर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी पर्हेप्स ऑफ द इधर द कॉन्सेप्ट और द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ नॉन बाय so actually you know i grew up in a family of uh, social activists so i'm the third generation my grandfather a freedom fighter uh, my uncle was in jail my parents independently were part of uh, uh, the freedom struggle and then my father and mother both being in the trade union and then meeting in the trade union getting married the social democrats both of them so it was a lot through osmosis you know one did actually understand that these were the values though they were gandhian socialists so you know there was always this overlap of means and end uh, you know when when discussions happened but a couple of things that i remember was i think i was in the fifth or something and i came back home uh, tired dejected and my father was extremely intuitive and you know he asked me what happened and i told him i had a argument with somebody in school and i was feeling terrible about it and he said well it's very human and you should feel bad when you argue with somebody you know you shouldn't feel the strength feeling of i've won this or you know i've conquered so you know good human being suffers through you know whatever we talk whatever we do so that's good but uh, he didn't ask me what happened he just asked me now you know suppose you went back to school tomorrow and the same thing happened what would you do and i said i i would do the same thing and i was shocked that you know uh, so he said well do you think the world is going to change overnight now then you change yourself if you are going to follow uh, the path of righteousness uh, then you change yourself you find the courage to deal with it uh, and of course you will suffer uh, but don't give up and i think that that was you know satyagraha and ahimsa just to be assertive not to give up your now but not to do it in a way like i vanquish somebody Uh, and that i think is the is the non violence so you know i think satya ka agraha and non violence and then i also saw my father uh, i also saw my father uh, uh, in satyagraha getting arrested never feeling bitter about it my mother losing so many jobs because my father used to be arrested and they never resented that my mother i think you know later on when she became a teacher there was a loss so i think there was kind of bitterness with my mother because obviously she somebody had to earn and bring a salary home because my father wasn't earning anything all his life he was a full timer of uh, you know mil mazdoor sabha hind mazdoor sabha in spite of being the national secretary but all he brought home was an honorarium until he died uh, so that was there but but no resentment about the fact that you know uh, that we didn't crave for acquisitions so i think that that is also a very non violent way of looking at things if you like something you don't have to possess it what is expensive is not beautiful uh, what is beautiful it does not have to be acquired don't feel jealous about somebody so so look at the big picture of inequality but don't feel upset if somebody gets something in their personal lives and i think that that was such a good way uh, allowed us to interact with a whole num- uh, you know different bunch of people without feeling any deprivation i'm feeling very happy and feeling proud about the choices that uh, my parents made yeah it's interesting that these are also very traditional values irsha dwesh grina hinsa these are all the things if we avoid we move towards a life uh, of well being and fulfillment or but the buddhists have a very uh, uh, i think accurate term they call them the afflictive emotions mm. but manisha by the time you were in college nakshalism and the idea of fighting the state in order to get uh, justice for the oppressed this was very much around and in fact at that time i think uh, it was also very valorized why were you never tempted to join that movement by the jp movement interesting uh, so there are like two or three different streams here so i grew up in a in a housing society called navsamaj which is was built by socialists my father was one of the founders i grew up in the sane guru ji katha mala i grew up in the rashtra seva dal shakha which was you know across the across the fence was the rss shakha here we were growing 
also extremely jingoistic, very, you know, kind of nationalist. And, you know, we didn't know that. I used to be in the front singing, you know, all the songs because we'd seen the war with China, we'd seen two wars with Pakistan. So, you know, it was all, all that was happening at one end. So I was embedded in this very interesting and very ironic kind of uh, uh, socialist upbringing. And then I did also, myself did Sani Guruji Katha Malas because by then I think I'd become a good storyteller. That was one. The second was that, you know, my uh, first cousin was involved in the first wave of Nakshalism. And uh, he had, you know, um, he, he, he moved out at one point. This would be late 60s or early 70s. Late 60s, late 60s. And my uh, father was the one family member and my mother, family members who stood by him at that time. And in fact, uh, he came home and stayed with us for about six months. Uh, when the family, his father was a government, uh, you know, officer and he was there. And uh, my mother used to tell my father saying that, you know, people, you know, grumble and say, you know, well, socialists said this should happen to Nakshal, you know, Nakshalites and stuff. My father said, no, uh, let anyone come to me and talk to me personally. I don't have to believe in a particular ideology to stand by. Uh, you know, I, I think he has a right to what he feels and what he believes in. Um, and he has a right to be loved and, uh, you know, have somebody be compassionate and stand by him during these difficult times. And, you know, his stay with us for those six months was so wonderful because, you know, we had, we had like an older sibling. I was the older one, you know, and we were two sisters. So there was this, you know, very nice older sibling, you know, not necessarily because he was a brother, but it was so lovely. And imagine this was like a, a one room kitchen apartment, you know, the one bedroom came like 25 years later when the society got some extra FSI and how we all lived in that uh, house. So, you know, I learned that you don't have to necessarily believe in a particular ideology that somebody can have a completely different ideology from you uh, and you don't have to subscribe to that. So this is, I'm just talking of not necessarily why I did not go that way, but you know, because I was steeped in this democratic socialism but at the same time to be compassionate. And you know, it's very interesting that even the ones who used to go and do the RSA Shakha on the side, if we went down the street, you know, they would like muss our hair and ask is everything okay at home. Uh, tell us if you need anything. Because then my dad was in Delhi for three years. Don't hesitate uh, to tell us. It was real compassion, real love. And everybody knew that we were absolutely opposite on the poles of political thought and political ideology. You know, when we talk later in this conversation about violent identity politics, I think this is very important, you know, to, to know that a particular policeman can be good, but you don't have to subscribe to the violent arm of the state, which is the police. Yeah, one particular army person can be a really nice person and you don't have to hate him and you don't have to go out and do something terrible or think bad about that person without forgetting the big picture about what the army does to people. So that was one. The second was because I was steeped in this socialist thought, one of the one of the natural ways for me to gravitate was the JP movement. So why didn't I stay in the Sevadal? Because everybody in the Sevadal, by then, you know, they were, were all uncles and aunties, including my parents. So I had to move away, you know, but you know, Mullah ki dod masjid tak, you know, how far do you, how far do you run? Yeah, so at that point, you know, this was like the 70s. Now, my sister went a little further than me in, you know, in left politics, but uh, so that was one. Uh, second was that my parents had been, uh, you know, um, uh, the clarion call of JP in the 1940s as the Marxist who had turned Gandhi and, you know, this firebrand person, uh, you know, I have met JP in my childhood. I have met Prabhavati Devi in my childhood, you know, Kriplaniji, all these people were, you know, people we met on a regular basis. Uh, so, you know, to, to go gravitate from there towards the JP movement was the easiest. I took, actually, I took this, I took the easiest path out. That was also the time of the emergency. So my father was not arrested because the Hindmasdu Sabha was divided. The secretaries were against the emergency. The presidents were pro-emergency and it was 5 million, 4.5, 5 million uh, strength. Indira Ji didn't want to wake up a sleeping giant. And so she didn't arrest because my father's name was on the arrest list, but he didn't get arrested. Uh, you know, underground literature, you know, people used to come and stay, you know, uh, all kinds of things were happening. And everybody knew this was a, this was a hub. And it, again, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, response of the police was also very important. You know, like the police would call up my mother and say, 
um, Vaini, we are coming for tea in the afternoon. So you had to shift the literature by afternoon. Yeah, you had to, you know. So all these things had to happen. Uh, then I started meeting JP during my uh, college days. That was another. So first I was studying in Sofa at that time. And Sofa and Jaslok were like just literally like a five minute walk. So I used to go to JP not knowing what, what was to do. But this was the JP who was, you know, uh, like the grandfather image of my childhood. Uh, you know, he was ill, you know, with the, with the uh, dialysis going on. He was in pain, you know, he had so much hematoma on his body. And so I would just go there literally like a lost, uh, you know, lamb, not knowing, not knowing at that time what to do. Um, so I used to go there and I used to spend time with the, uh, JP. So there are two very uh, funny episodes here. One is, you know, the CID, how they tried to frighten me in the beginning. Uh, they rang up, they asked me, give me your father's phone number. So I gave them my father's phone number. They rang up my father in uh, Milmazu Sabha. And they told my father, do you know that your daughter comes to see JP five days a week? Uh, so my father says, that's terrible, you know. I have to tell her to go the remaining two days. I don't know why she's not going that those days. So I'll, I'll convey your message to her and I'll see that she's there all seven days, you know. So then they stopped, uh, stopped hassling me because they knew I was a gone case. And I was this, you know, 17-year-old, you know, person. And so then they would tell me, I think they were also boasting a little bit. You know that floor in the front that's taken by us. There are all the people sitting there. You know that lift person, he's ours. That nurse, he's ours. They would regale me with stories. Uh, you know, and I used to sit there outside and whenever allowed, go and sit inside with JP. No, sorry, Manisha, so, this is the police. The police would tell you this. The CID, the CID, yeah. You know, they were, they were you know, okay, the okay. IB. So they were like, you know, they were like the, the, strong, the, the stronger, deeper arm of, yes, you know. Yes. And yes. then, um, as a way of trying to intimidate you, perhaps intimidate and also have fun because you know they had nobody to talk to for eight hours duty. No, they had. They were not intimidating me. They were. They were. You know, impressing me that now that you are here, we might as well tell you lots of stories. And then, interesting part was when JP was suddenly taken to Patna. You know, when they thought he was probably going to die, and you know, Chandan karke bhi rakha hua tha. I get this message from uh, you know my dad's colleague. Uh, that tell Manisha to come to the airport tomorrow morning. I go to the airport at seven, as you know, they said, and I see JP being wheeled inside and I was distraught. And then suddenly somebody pushes me in the small back of my, you know, small of my back and closes the gate so I can go and meet JP. And it's one of the police that have pushed me in so that I can go and say goodbye to JP. So what I'm saying is, you know, this is the police. I'm, I'm not confused with this arm of the police. I know what they were doing at that time to the left to the far left, I know what they were doing. Uh, but, you know, at one point where the RSS says, you know, they are 40,000, we are 42,000. we are, And now I think it's 42 plus 40 almost. It's, so how the entire, entire state and its representatives that are supposed to be unbiased, you know, the army, how everybody is moving right wing. And I think, you know, that that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I don't have, I don't have much faith in, in, you know, in the state as it exists, you know, the government, yes, you know, we've elected the government and the government has to do some things for us that I fully agree and they have to be answerable and I, I believe in state accountability and I believe in state answerability and I believe in the rights and the human rights approach. Uh, but it's very, it's very saddening to know that, you know, those who have taken the oath, those who are on the social contract with people to protect their rights, uh, collecting taxes on our name, living in, you know, the house that we lease out to them, the parliament for five years, uh, you know, and we can change the people who go into that house five years later. Uh, for them to take partisan and for them to become part of this uh, um, cultural nationalism and the hate, I think that really is uh, is very, very scary. So that's how I veer towards the JP movement. Not, not, there were lots of personal uh, emotional issues. Uh, I was still within the social democrat framework, uh, but I was away from, you know, all, all my very loving uncles and aunties into something that I could grow a little bit further away from these beautiful lush trees that gave me a lot of shade. So I tried to move out of the shadow, not the shade. Bahut cool. Bahut cool. Uh, so Manisha, many people who have been part of Ahimsa conversations and who were also in the JP movement have spoken about the famous slogan, Hamla chahe jaisa hoga, haath hamara nahi uthega. 
uh, what were some of your challenges in living by that? Because see, it's not, it sounds very beautiful, but it's not always easy to do. That no matter how we are attacked, we will not retaliate with violence. How, what were the challenges you faced in living this principle? I would separate here the, 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 the personal is the political, but I would separate an individual incident from the political. So if, you know, say somebody who is, you know, who is being harassed for the entire lifetime, uh, you know, suddenly a quick burst of violence happens. I'm not going to condemn that. And there, you know, that's where JP talked of peaceful means. Yeah, it's not, not uh, you know, the, the means are peaceful. So if there is, there is an uprising suddenly, uh, I would not, I would not condemn immediately and say, I would try to look at what is the proactive violence and I would look at what is the reactive violence and I would not be very quick to pass judgment upon what happened. But in means you tell me what is the way out? What is the way out? If we have to get everybody involved, uh, if we are not going to have a, a Kader, uh post-revolution, uh, that is uh, themselves called arms, dangerous arms that we have used during the struggle. Where are those arms going to be used after that? Uh, where is the toxic masculinity that gets created uh, during that, where is it? It's going to come back to bite the women in the house. You know, when after Gujarat, I, I used to wander on the streets, you know, and I thought I'd lost my sense of reason. I have to look at somebody and I used to say, do you think this is a rapist? I would ask myself, could this man have murdered? Could this man have raped? Uh, and I was losing my sense of proportion when I saw uh, people on the street. And, you know, when I saw women, I used to think, uh, do you know that, you know, your brother, husband, son, raped outside, but that you are living with a rapist all your life now? You are living with a killer. Do you know what a killer can do the second time? There is no taboo uh, the second time when you take human life the first time. And do you know what kind of precipice you are living in? Like sometimes I think about our families that are becoming right-wing. Don't you know you are creating a lynch mob of the next generation? But of course, somebody who is Savarna will never be caught with the Trishul, will never be caught with the sword will never be caught with that. It will always be the Dalits. It will always be the tribals. It will always be the people who are, uh, you know, the poor, the disenfranchised. Ours will be the lieutenants. I will be the, you know, the governors who will sit behind, you know, on the elephants and let the foot soldiers go and be uh, cannon fodder. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is what I feel that, you know, uh, if the struggle is violent, uh, automatically there is a certain amount of secrecy that uh, comes in. You cannot trust anybody. I'm, I'm, why, I am not, I'm not bringing this down to things like violence and non-violence. Okay, I'm just talking of a guerrilla kind of, uh, you know, a struggle. Uh, you have to have a small trusted group. You cannot trust everybody within that group. Uh, you know, so there's groups within groups. You have to be politically correct all the time. Uh, you won't be able to express your opinion because of uh, the fear of the big outside, as well as, you know, what you might be marked as inside. Uh, all this leads to a certain amount of alienation from the people. Uh, and democracy is building not just cadres, it's work with masses. It's, you know, where you have to have the mass support, the mass, and not always revolutionary. It's, it's a few steps forward, it's, a, it's some steps back. What you have to count after some years is forward may not always be forward in the way that, uh, uh, you know, enhances the values that we believe in. So the forward at that point may be a success, but not necessarily a success in the long term. A step that may have been taken backward at that time may actually be the step that, you know, you will say that was the right step to take because, you know, we did not uh, take particular, you know, decision at that time because people were not ready. So that's why I think that, you know, there is no alternative. Uh, there is no alternative to uh, the means and the end being justified as a feminist there is no alternative to the personal being the political. So if we organize, I don't think that organizing on the basis of um, a violent struggle takes us any further in the kind of society that we want, both inside the house and outside the house. So as a feminist, uh, the artificial domain between the private sphere and the public sphere uh, has to be challenged. And we cannot have uh, democracy outside without democracy inside and democracy inside without democracy outside. That's the reason I believe in uh, this without again being judgmental towards anybody who is uh, uh, using violence. But proactive violence, yeah, if you go out and 
hurt somebody who is subordinated you go and hurt out somebody who is a minority person uh, somebody who is already marginalized already excluded then even that first act of violence i would condemn see also manisha there is a uh, related issue it came it struck me when you were talking about you know your childhood experience in the rashtra seva dal which was a socialist gandhian organization and how across the fence was the rss uh, you know shakha that uh, and you talked about how much part of the same society you were how you know there was a sense of almost camaraderie even though ideologically you were radically different and you know many of us have experienced that so we many of us have had friends in the rss even though we may uh, not agree with the ideology when did this change see because in those in those days one never heard of uh, somebody who was opposed to the idea of hindu nationalism getting a death threat or being uh, verbally abused uh so or even the idea that um to be armed and be capable of violence is to be brave and strong and all those who talk about non violence are just weak when did this change happen as far as you can tell in this last 40 year period uh so uh, are you asking whether when the change happened in me or when no, no, as per your observation this is not an academic question because i i see that you live through the transitions and you know you what you said earlier uh illustrated a, a sensitivity yeah. that uh, because see uh, it's because you had ideological differences but that didn't stop you from being neighborhood friends when did that why has okay forget when actually the when may not be so relevant yeah, yeah. but yeah. you know what changed that we are now in the situation where in within a family there are such bitter uh, feelings on these issues you see when the you have you know like you have the congress government which you know also you know didn't love minorities but they were a, a short vote bank and you see them also moving uh, towards the hindu vote bank when they realize that if they who the hindus then you have a majority vote so you know koi dwesh se marta hai koi you know um, you know isse marta hai because of you know it's 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 the is the crime of commission or a crime of omission you know and i think that that's what it is but having a state uh, you know that patronizes a certain kind of thought so for example earlier what people thought and there was always one weird uncle or auntie or some you know grand uncle in the family uh, who raved and ranted at family meetings or ga gatherings and everybody listened to him and said come on now come and eat dinner and just ignore him and everything was you know hunky dory i'm sorry raved and ranted in what sense can you just spell that in, out you know in this this hate kind of a thing you know that aisa karna chahiye war hona chahiye and the only way to peace is war Uh, destroy you know pakistan and then we'll have peace and uh, spoke okay. stuff like that got it got it uh, the anti you know anti uh, other religion rhetoric always existed in 15 different examples like uh, they you know wo apni um, uh, you know uh, you know you know much hindus grow their mustaches muslims grow their beard they, you know we wash our hands like this you know you know doctors you the butter wars you know so we wash our hands like this and they wash our hands like this and you know their uh, uh, unki jo uh, hai you know choti bahar rehti hai apni i used to listen to this from distant relatives having heard that i would say so what and they had no answer now my best friend then was a muslim and you know somebody used to say marry anybody but don't marry a muslim and i would say okay shall i marry a cat shall i marry a dog Uh, you know like what do you mean whom so what i'm saying is that these people were there on the periphery uh, they did think but you know we because the poison was not uh, had not reached a point where it had become toxic to all of us to the extent uh, it's like the frog you know you put it suddenly in 56 degree centigrade what it's going to die you raise it 1 degree at a time so it was there it's not that it wasn't there but it wasn't the popular rhetoric as the right wing gained in popularity 
so did this become thicker and so did the rhetoric outside so now what people thought they started speaking what they spoke they started doing and when they did something they knew that they were not going to be caught that they were not going to be arrested there was impu they could do it with impunity because they had amnesty from the state and that i see as a continuum from the people we are close to with whom we have these very mixed feelings uh, you know the people who will run when you are in hospital who will run for you around that time uh, you know who say oh they do good social work it could be rss it could be jamaat e islami it could be any kind of work but they do good social work they have no clue the relatives of what kind you do you're just doing social work from here to the ones who are actually hardened what is shocking to us is at a personal level that rather naive thinking that you know realizing that uh, uh, you know right wing forces have been there for close to 100 years in our country uh, they have been there internationally for so long they have been working doggedly so really we shouldn't be shocked there but as human beings we are shocked because now we find that the majority of the family believes in that uh, what is shocking is that you know the common rhetoric is become so the poisonous plants were always there the weeds were always there but now the air is poisonous and so therefore which is the plant that now gets an advantage over the other plants to grow uh, and through our non work commitment to non violence towards social change that is collective social change that is transformative social change that you know in, in, that you know um, strengthens the values enshrined, enshrined in our indian constitution i think those are the plants we have to nurture and to do that we cannot just divide now we cannot just you know cannot be fighting one person at a time though we we'll have to do that you know maybe you know whatsapp groups how many groups we are leaving how many groups you know we are we are arguing and you know being marginalized on those groups but i think we have to do something about the poisonous air you know and that is the big picture of you know being able to um, you know so uh, i think that is that is the that is the real issue where uh, violence has become part of uh, daily life just look at just look at people who are out on the street no pehle it used to be um, i I'll, i'll you know see now if you do this i'm going to you know slap you i'm going to punch you and that used to go on for some time yeah and then it would escalate and then it would escalate uh, now probably only the uh, poor drunks on the street do that whole drama of you know one act to another act if you see any fight on the road the first action is a kick in the kidneys the first action is to start beating the person to death you know the violence escalates within a within a few seconds it doesn't take any time to ignite because you know you have this inflammable environment all around and that is what is happening and looking at that kind of toxic masculinity looking at that kind of violence that grows in this poisonous air imagine all the young children imagine the boys that are growing on this not only are they seeing that a woman in the family can be beaten but now they see that this is the way to behave towards all women this is the way to behave towards all minorities towards all trans persons towards you know anybody who isn't is not ours and this whole whole politics of ours and theirs constantly if there is a rape the question that is asked is was the rape person ours or was the rapist ours yeah now we have to remember that a rapist can never be ours right and a rape person can never be theirs uh, you know and this whole thing of ours and theirs and this schism between people this lack of love this lack of compassion um, this lack of not being able to hear the screams the angst of people uh, you know not feeling anything i think this has happened because of this poisonous air we are not allowed to love anymore uh, we are not allowed to feel anymore Uh, our attention span is you know 10 seconds of when i get something on the whatsapp before i forward it once i forwarded it i don't read it again you know by by which time i have made it uh, you know i have made it viral and other people are forwarding it so really it doesn't matter you know it's like you know those chain cosmetics it doesn't matter whether you use the cosmetic what you have to go is you have to do the chain and get another five people who will sell that cosmetic so you you know get back something yeah i don't think you even get back anything Uh, but what happens is that with these repeated messages misogynist jokes you know caste based jokes you know anti religion jokes anti pakistan jokes uh, and this very vitriolic real politic of hate uh, that gets bombarded every day i think that is what keeps rising the temperature one degree at a time uh, 
and some are going there much faster. A lot of people are not there across the fence. Uh, but you know, they are finding that argument uh, better because the, even those who are middle class educated, everybody is not getting that, you know, oh, campus interview, they got like five crores of a package. They're not getting that. Then who is to blame? Then, you know, it's the Dalits who get the reservations, you know, in, it's the women who have reservations in politics. Uh, so this is the best way to deflect any kind of class solidarity, any kind of progressive solidarity. It's not even caste solidarity. It's okay. false cost caste. You know, the, the Maratha who owns the sugar cooperative, you know, trying to show that, you know, is, is, is with the Maratha who is out there on the street, you know, shouting these vacuous slogans. They are not the same. But what gets pulled up is, you know, that there is nobody to save us. And now this is the only thing that's going to save us. So I think, you know, our job, this is not to paralyze us, overwhelm us. This is to realize that uh, the different places in which we have to start working uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, bringing about this very progressive uh, and radical social transformation. How do you keep your morale up, uh, Manisha? Because this is, in a sense, exactly what the feminist movement has been trying to do. Uh, you know, you have been a very major activist of that movement, I would say easily now 40 years or more. And I remember from the debates in the 80s that this question of women, yes, the, who are the oppressed, who have been the recipients of so much violence, are not, but that, that the women's movement is not seeking to reverse that equation, but to change it, to build a new society which will, in which there will be neither, uh, you know, gender violence nor retributive violence. So how, uh, you know, uh, can you, uh, in your experiences, because then you're also the founder of Masoom, in your actual work with women, what are some of the silver linings? Because I know we have, it's not like we've lost all ground, we did gain ground. In what forms does that manifest? You know, in what ways is, in a sense, that good struggle still persisting? See, even within the uh, women's movement or, you know, at that point, which we didn't consider as their movement, you know, whether it was the renaming of uh, uh, the Maratwara University as, you know, the Ambedkar University or the work that we were doing in, in uh, Bombay through the Chhatraiwa Sangarshwaini in the in the you know uh, slums of Bombay, or when we moved uh, Ramesh and I and you know the our son you know we moved uh, to live in a tiny village. I see it as a continuum. Uh, the whenever you see the protest was always marches, right? It wasn't. It wasn't once in a while there's to be a be a vigil alante kind of a activity, uh, but not. Not as an organized thing, there was no vigilante activity that, you know, we're we are planning to go and we are going to do something like this. It wasn't like that. The vigilante activity might have taken place at that time. Uh, but the arguments, you know, whether, you know, they were, they were uh, Gandhians, whether they were center of left, whether they were, you know, women from left parties or movements or, or people's organizations. Within the women's movement, the, the modus operandi was always a march, was always, you know, so it, it, it was it was very much rooted within the Indian way of, uh, uh, of you know, the Indian way of, I would say the Gandhian way, you know, the kind of the freedom because movement Because it's way. also participatory. It's participatory. And, you know, a lot of people can come in, women from Bastis were coming in. So, uh, so that was happening. Uh, and then, of course, there was also specific planning for what to do, what not to do. So Satyagraha, for example, in Sangharshwain, you know, Satyagraha was the method so, you know, whether you go and occupy the race course uh, fringes because, you know, they're breaking slums to say you have place for gambling, but not for, you know, so 2nd October, choosing dates of a particular kind. So, you know, all these different, though they're symbols, but those symbols were very important. So I think, you know, the feminist movement also uh, was built very much on a very strong political understanding of state violence. So take, see the first, first few instances that were taken up was Ramiza B uh, in Hyderabad, you know, the police, you know, killing her husband, Maya Tyagi, who is, you know, killed by uh, families killed, you know, uh, uh, you know, who's humiliated physically and family are killed by police. Uh, Mathura, you know, I'm, I'm naming these people, now. we don't name people, but at that time, these names are now are all out there. So that's the reason I'm naming these, uh, you know, uh, very brave women. Uh, 
uh, you know, the police. So that that was, if you see that those, you know, um, uh, so domestic violence were, were was also taken up because we were conscious of the private sphere, but it was rather state violence. And you know, here everybody was coming in because in their particular groups, including you know, including our group. Now the the woman question was taken up, or you know, uh, for example, nari um, nari ke sehbag bina har sangar shadura hai. You know, so all all these different you know uh, slogans were there in Bihar. You know, the land that was from the Mahat was not distributed until it was in joint ownership. So all those things were there. Yet, feminism, the modern thought of feminism, was so beguiling, was so enticing. that everybody was putting one foot out so you know you had like a room in which you were it was your group and everybody had theirs but everybody had one foot in this common room that was the women's room and i think you know that's what you know sometimes in the women's movement you know we were arguing sometimes in favor of what you know the men were doing there the groups you know say jane do in the groups we were vociferously fighting for what was happening out there you know so we were you know absolutely you know um, you know assertive about that i think that's how you know the center left onwards what was the women's movement was and that's why there was a particular understanding of what kind of social transformation we want uh, that you know kept us that kept us you know that kept us breathing that kept us get gave us the oxygen that was required um, so from bombay when then we shifted into the village and then you saw the resilience of the people who had suffered centuries of violence centuries the dalits you know the ntdnt uh, you know the women you know the kind what they had gone through and yet being able to laugh in meetings you know yet being able to crack jokes you know yet being you know not being constantly you know worried and you know kind of internally frowning about you know the impatience of the social change and you know the kind of slow pace you know the kind of outside slow pace of the village life and the slow pace of change it doesn't happen overnight is something that you know i learned better when i went to the village the second thing i learned was you know to listen to silence because when you listen to silence you are listening to the silenced you know and the silence speaks volumes uh, and it gives you goosebumps you know when somebody isn't speaking and you know the the body language or even lack of body language the catatonic posture so you know so the the body is otherwise responding to you know the breeze to the children coming into the meeting etc and suddenly you have a catatonic silence when the sarpanch says something or the police patil says something or somebody chooses at that point you know to spit outside or you know a glance at somebody across the room or give you a particular glance or you know this very um, minuscule nod saying don't believe don't agree or doing nothing you know i think those were the moments of learning and unlearning how not to just hear but to listen uh, how to not always take what you hear as what you should you know remember and how to how to go into something that you haven't and don't assume so when in doubt ask is what people taught us uh, whatever you think you can do well alone uh, you can do better collectively uh, when in doubt democratize uh, always collectivize because what you might think is really good might might bring a result overnight is going to be washed away the only only way that is going to work is if you go uh, together when we start working uh, with rural people uh, which was you know it's just different when you go into a basti and come back at night the 9 to 5 and the 5 to 9 are two separate worlds and to be there from the 5 to 9 living in a community in a rented house within the village uh, you know the kind of the kind of openness and the trust that people had in us when they shared things that happened inside uh, the kind of uh, the kind of domestic situations we saw uh, the political insights we got while we were there uh, i think you know that i'm and i'm not i'm saying this not i'm not saying this in a patronizing way it's the best university uh, you know because it was a three dimensional university Uh, which not only taught us to learn, I think, but it, it taught us what universities don't teach us is to unlearn, unlearn a lot of ways. JP used to say, you know, when you are in a march, you know, it's you are in the headlines on the first day. Next day, it's newspaper. 
it's just newsprint it's nothing more than that the real change happens you know where people are go people listen talk and i think that that you know not necessarily because of that advice but you know we uh, you know were enamored to go there and then that is how masoom started so if you see women you know who were suffered who how how they how they use verbal abuse as a way of deflecting men so they're not actually beating because beating is suicide you know i mean it's you know it's if the if the if the if the oppressed act openly it's a call for suicide right so you know as james scott will talk of weapons of the weak and you know talks of the different ways in which you know that resistance will come uh, you know the resistance that we saw telling people that you know uh the well known ways of humiliating somebody put somebody on a donkey black in their face no blackening is racist uh, you know putting somebody on a donkey first of all you know is an insult to an animal who doesn't give consent to be paraded in a humiliating situation and it just makes the toughens the person it's like sending somebody you know who's a juvenile in conflict with the law into a bunch of hardened criminals in prison you know i mean you're not you're not doing you're doing only damage to that child right so uh, so it's only going to harden the person because there's no there's no there's no possibility of dialogue left and i feel that every time you close a door if you have to uh, we have to we have to always be careful that a window is open before we close that door and and that window you're saying is the is the possibility of dialogue the dialogue the dialogue so you know for example you know we had filed a case against a, a, a middle aged maratha man uh, who had you know attempted to molest a dalit girl that also the child of a vagya and murli so they are not legally married and they are given to the gods it was like the the in among dalits and patriarch also and we filed a case against him we fought the case or if that that was you know it's it's a long story uh, some other conversation uh but when his sister suffered domestic violence 6 months or one year later she came to masoom yeah so that was the conversation that was there people knew it when the air uh, you know at that point this one of the vigilante activities i don't believe in this kind of vigilante activities but the women took up was to do a daru bandi and was to go and you know kind of uh, break the daru guttas you know the the illicit liquor shop and you know the women went on a rampage you know did that i'm not going to pass judgment because of what you know what the sexual politics and the economic politics and the cultural politics of alcohol is there is nothing like social drinking and a social drinking and anti social drinking uh, which you know which you can you can separate and then this easy rhetoric of uh, violence happens because of alcohol no it doesn't you know so we had to break that at one end that a non alcoholic you know can be complete can be totally violent and uh, alcoholic has never raised his hand or his voice so we had to do that at one end. but when this vigilante activity took place and of course the she was not a rich person you know uh, who own uh, you know not own that shop the capital used to come from the rich the people who sold it were the poor that is how the politics was uh, but when she had tuberculosis she came to masoom because she knew this was the only place who would uh, see that her one and a half year treatment uh, took place through the government services so they wouldn't have done that if of course there was a need and who doesn't come so i'm not saying oh it's big only because of the way we acted but what i'm saying is that when they came they were received respectfully nobody said nobody said made snide comments uh, they were you know treated as any other human being ought to be treated so actually this you know resilience of you know how to go about uh, we learned partially from the people and partially from the politics that we brought from outside on our own the baggage that we took so for example even never allow the police to torture somebody in 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 the police cell we would never allow the police to enter a home without a warrant because if you allow that today if you take four people into the forest in hyderabad and you do an encounter after rape yeah uh, who are you going to be able to do that to right is the same thing right take four people you think they've raped this girl go into the forest and have an encounter you allow the police you know to torture or to go inside first of all it's wrong at a principle and ideological level even at a pragmatic level whose house will the police be able to enter without a warrant tomorrow whose houses will those be will you have any say or control will you be able to uh, you know in all all ethical kind of you know weight would you be able to stand up and uh, condemn that act when you have used the same acts so the means and end are very important
it's not just the end but the means so you know as gandhi says there is no road to peace peace is the road and i think that you don't know, we cannot have again what i believe you know uh, rajni is that there is no big goal post waiting for us at the end of our life uh, one that the higher you climb the hill the horizon grows so there is nothing like the horizon uh, yeah the taller you climb the bigger the horizon becomes so there is no goal post secondly you know there is no job that is done when you reach somewhere else there is another question that gets asked so therefore let every step of your life be the gift so when i talk to you this conversation is the gift in itself and we have to learn to recognize these gifts we have to learn to recognize that you know this is you know if i drop dead right now uh, i have still got the gift you know even if i if i don't know whether this video gets done or not you know but the gift is here and now yes. uh, as a buddhist yes. you know i'm sure you you know the the yeah. here and now and that here and now affairs says you know that uh, uh, you know bhuk kinara you know he says no pal bhar mein amal pal bhar mein dhua yeah so in that one pal when it's there that bhuk kinara that kit shifting you know the, the line between the light and the dark you know so but when it's there it's amal it's happening Yeah, and pal bhar mein dhua, you yeah. know. So I think you know, that that you know, kind of that moment, uh, which really is the only moment you're living, uh, yeah. is precious. And so do not, do not, uh, you know, kind of don't impoverish yourself uh, by not giving yourself those gifts every moment that you live. Yeah. I think you know that is what keeps us up, you know, and uh, uh, that that brings joy. People say, you know, you. Uh, you know it now. You know you've done this. You know sacrifice. That's one thing my father taught me. Sacrifice is a perverse concept. He used to say, "If you want something, go out and get it. Why are you beating the world with what you didn't go out and get? If you wanted it so much, have the have the courage to go and get it." So that's what you know, uh, Ramesh and I also realized throughout our lives. What did we lose? Nothing. Yeah. What did we gain? Everything. Look at the happiness. You know. Look at you know uh, the sense of fulfillment. Look at the look at this um, this completely undying hope uh, that you know that unless we act there won't be a change i don't think in my lifetime i'm going to see a much better india right? but if i don't act what is going to happen to my social children my social grandchildren uh, do i have the right to leave this planet you know when i found it in a slightly better place when i was born 65 years ago do i have the right to leave it in a mess um, and it's not also everything about rights and what i have to do but because that's what i want to do and i think that the joy that we get the fulfillment that we get uh, you know and and so when i get the joy and fulfillment of what i want to do my joy and fulfillment which is small j with small f cannot be complete without the big j joy and the fulfillment which is for the entire world and i think you know that what is inside and outside are not two separate things uh, you know though my parents were atheists i was raised an atheist ramesh is an atheist so we have no religious framework but i think you know that this talk might almost sound spiritual but actually i think you know it's a commitment towards the love inside and the universal love outside and the faith inside and the universal love why are we ready to uh, live or die for a particular belief you know it's because that's what we think inside should happen right so there is no there is no you know i remember one particular incident where there were two warring close to midnight two warring you know, with the kulhadis and you know the ramoshis with the kulhadis the dalits were on this side and uh, you know it, it's again it's a long story but uh, you know uh, it was it was it was very marginally connected to some people who were working in masoom what they had done in their personal lives and the people came running to us you know doctor tai you know these you know two groups are you know at you know are going to kill each other it's come pitch dark our children then i think pratik was three and priya was you know probably an infant or maybe he was three and a half and she was one or something like that uh, younger than that you know at that moment these moments of judgment uh, where your life doesn't matter mm -hmm. and we just told the neighbors look after the children and ramesh and i went and stood in between those two groups at close to midnight and told them that you know two dalit groups will fight in this village over our dead bodies we are here you know start with and my father had done this once when there was an attack and he had gone in between in front of a violent mob 
and said that you know you cannot go there over my dead body i'm not saying that necessarily i thought of my father when we did that uh, but there is that moment you know say so you you see a you see a burning house and you see a child that's burning you don't care about the life right you won't do it every day you won't put your life on the line every day this but after that you won't be able to live or breathe in peace until you die Uh, and i think those moments of realization you know tell you uh, what to do yeah thank you in the health sphere is there are there any observations because you have also been such a diligent and intensive activist in women and health um, and i think you've been engaged in many international platforms um is there any dimension of that in which you see the issue of violence non violence uh being a factor so you know the um, the international feminist movement you know especially the health movement came out much more in terms of body they were radical feminists we learned a lot from radical feminists because it was the church the control over body abortion contraception uh you know we were much more dealing with state violence from where we came uh, together i think you know more or less the you know the movements from the 70s until now uh, have been uh, resisting state violence resisting say for example in india forced population control over the poor over the marginalized um, more and more invasive contraceptives for women versus you know uh, you know having having development so obviously should people have contraception should people have the access to abortion absolutely irrespective of marriage irrespective of any questions asked but the state policy you know so lower population uh, increase the growth you know higher and like the nazi you know you're also finding something like biological hinduism here you know where you know like in probably we'll also grow uh, studs that are you know uh, dna wise genetically you know what we call the pure race you know because we are learning so much from Uh, you know from uh, nazi germany and what they did uh, so state violence uh, the control of religion the control of family the com- control of communities on my right to choose a partner my right when to have a child and contraception or access to abortion uh, or you know knowing about my body uh, is not about not about the power of knowing it it i feel empowered but it's not a bad power it's about changing the system in which people look at women's bodies then my struggle has to be patient uh, you know so when we started teaching our rural community health workers uh, to how to do an internal speculum examination with the with the mirror and with the torch and to be able to see your cervix smell the white discharge see how physiological discharge smells see how pathological discharge smells see how the cervix looks during um, periods how does it look when you don't have periods it's it's a great empowerment yet the speculum cannot become an instrument of power it cannot be used against people and so first what do you do you first person you insert the speculum in, in your own body not only that you don't do the skills unless you have gone through gender patriarchy with feminist teaching uh, this entire course and so therefore understanding that you know this knowledge is about uh, a power that is collectively owned uh, that is not that is not something that you know i use against people because we know knowledge is power right so how how do you how do you uh, how do you plan your work in a way that immediately people do get relief uh, but at the same time this particular act doesn't go against your conviction of a social transformation and i think that that uh, you know uh, is is the value that you learn sometimes uh, through mistakes you learn sometimes through uh, uh, you know educated guesses then sometimes it becomes like you know you drive or cycle or swim without thinking uh, and then your job is then to pass it on to the next generation so in closing manisha what advice or what would you share with young people today uh, a lot of young people i meet are drawn to the course of non violence and yet they sometimes feel daunted with all this toxicity that they see around they experience uh as you said the poison in the air uh so what anything you would like to share about how they can cultivate inner strengths uh you know to to stay the path to stay the course i think 
say, you know, that not become like the oppressor, violent identity politics that is exclusionary, that is toxic, misogynist, go forward. Let's not use those same methods. Uh, let's, let's, let's counter hate with love. Now people might think, you know, this is the rambling of, you know, somebody who's, you know, becoming a dinosaur, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, I really believe that the only way that we can counter, see, for example, let me go back to what I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, it's when you stop loving that you stop hearing other people's issues. And the best way not to love is to hate. But now to say to hate somebody uh, is against the very traditional way of parenting. People don't say hate, right? They give. So then what do you do? You teach fear. So you bring a phobia. Yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not hating somebody. You're just afraid of them. Yeah. Uh, so Islamophobia is we don't hate the Muslims. We're afraid of them. Yeah, they're going to do this to the country. Yeah. And so first you teach the phobia. Yeah? And where does phobia and fear come from? It comes from violence of thought. Yeah? You're afraid when you're violent, you become violent when you're afraid or you want to, you want to put somebody in their place or you want to spread fear. Uh, you know, that's when you have to use violence. So uh, love at this point, I would say, has become a dangerous act. Uh, because if you love, only then you will hear. Yeah? Uh, only then will you not be able to sleep at night, not in a bad way. Uh, but, you know, you will wonder about the privileges and entitlements that some people have and some don't have. Uh, and that you have to do something about it. And so, therefore, for all of us who have loved passionately, who have loved dangerously, uh, I think, and the young, you know, I mean, what is what is more enticing than loving, uh, you know? So, I would say whether it your, it's your romantic love, you know, whether it's the love of friendships, uh, whether it's the love of whom you will talk to, you know, the, whom you will listen to, uh, just expand that circle. Become part of other circles that listen to other people. Uh, you know, don't get caught down by just one rhetoric of hate. Uh, because love now today is, is an act that will liberate us. Uh, it, love and compassion will also sustain us once all our campaigns for the right to health, the right to food, the right to gender equality are all won. So why am I sitting out on the street to say a uh, hospital shouldn't be privatized? Uh, it's because my social children and grandchildren uh, have a, a universal access to health care you know, irrespective of ability to pay, right? Having got that, now what's going to sustain that generation? It's going to be the same uh, values of love and compassion. So if we just if we just change the name of the category of people uh, with another category of people, but our rhetoric remains the same, our script remains the same, then it's not, we are not challenging hegemony. We are only challenging who is on the upper rung of the ladder and who is on the lower rung of the ladder. And we have to remember that as long as there is somebody below me is the only way I am going to accept somebody above me. Uh, so in the caste system, you know, if I know there is somebody who is lower in me in, in caste, only then I accept the caste system. To a woman, if you say that, you know, you uh, get married according to our wishes, you have a son, you raise the son, you get married, then you'll get a daughter-in-law as a bonus at the end of your life insurance policy when it matures, right? So she's always given that hope of rising into the, uh, you know, the honorary citizenship, the honorary membership, citizenship of the family. So she says, we don't do things like this in our home. She's not talking of her mother's home. She's talking of the husband's home in which she's also a daughter-in-law. But now she's a daughter-in-law at an exalted position. We haven't changed the system in any way. And so therefore, to be able to change the system, we have to change the script. We have to change this notion of a ladder. We have to change the notion of somebody above and somebody below. I said earlier, listen to silence. I would say not only listen to silence, but listen to those who are silenced, not in a patronizing way, not saying, oh, see, we are so good. You know, we've included you. We've given you the mic. Who are we to give the mic? We appropriated it for these hundreds of years. Right? So there is a way in which the subordinated and excluded people see society in a way that nobody so Just give an example. You ask a husband what he likes. I don't know. My wife knows. What does your wife like? I don't even know. You ask the wife what the husband knows. She knows exactly what he likes yeah? uh, because she is, you know, schooled into that. Uh, you know, so how to change the system? I found 
through a lot my entire life including my phd which was on the concept of patriarchal and caste honor that those who are on the margins those who have been marginalized excluded have the best means of challenging the system because they have seen the ugly face of patriarchy somebody who's widowed you know uh, look at the word widow we never say there's a widow right but you know somebody who's thrown out a sex worker a hilda uh, you know living in the dayar uh, yeah a person who got thrown out because of a gender identity got thrown out because you know her husband was beating her and she you know resisted that Uh, somebody who married against their family's wishes have seen the ugly face of patriarchy and caste whereas those in the center have only seen the best face so so you you you, you so the sheep that walk in the center to the slaughter house don't need monitoring but those who are on the outside need the dogs to keep the outer in right so that the, only the outer sheep see the dog the ones in the centers don't see the dogs at all they don't need the dog they're walking themselves to the slaughter house and i think you know therefore the ones on the outer rim know how to deal with those dogs and i i firmly believe that the only people who can really change the system are the ones who have been oppressed by that system who faced multiple discriminations who you know gone through the complex matrix of multiple dominations and exclusion and so if you really want to change the system i am saying that let sit in the audience let you know let the people who are you know uh, who know better than us let them teach us uh, you know uh, so in humility learn uh, learn from the people who know so it's actually for uh, the change that we really need to listen and that that's where we need to uh, unlearn so i think you know when we do that Uh, is when the real social transformation will change so and again for that the whole circle no then therefore how will you meet somebody from a different caste different religion uh, it's uh, the opening of friendships is the opening of love it's the opening of compassion so what i'm saying is you know they are all connected uh, with each other and we support but which doesn't which you are not uh, so don't take the leadership there Uh, but when when you have to stand there when a moment of danger comes do not say i am not like that so just to give an example you know you're working with say a minority community don't take the leadership there but if there is an attack while you are there and they are out to get minority people do not say i am not like them yeah so stick your neck out that's when you are with the group uh, and don't be in the leadership position that's the way you are with them so to be with them and then the last is of course once you know you transcend the communion of what is inside and outside really there is no them them where do you end and where does the them start in the same with you so i think you know finally it is love compassion non violence peaceful means no violence of action no violence of thought um so you know one is not here just because one thinks that oh this is you know what one is schooled in or this is what you know is is the is the only way i know no amongst the various ways one knows uh, you know this is something one has a conviction that it's going to uh, at now 100 200 years later somebody might you know say no that wasn't the way and that's fine that's fine but for the moment for the world to heal i think this is the only way to give to go forward uh, to love uh, uh, to not be afraid to love and not be afraid to be loved Uh, because you know sometimes we are even afraid to be loved